Greetings, ICO friends. Matthew Kramer here for another Mocktails and Masterpieces. Uh, tonight's program is a very special one indeed. As you know, if you've tuned in uh, at all here uh, over the last several months, you know we've been exclusively virtual. Uh, we did return to the concert hall uh, in November and December uh, with a virtual program uh, streaming for our patrons. Uh, on January 30th, we returned to Clues Hall for our first in-person concert in an entire year. Uh, our last performance was in January 2020, and we had no idea at the time that that would be the last time we'd be performing live uh, for our patrons. And of course, the world has turned on its head. Uh, we hope to see a ray of light here uh, as we start moving towards vaccinations and hopefully some return to normalcy over the summer. Uh, but this is a very a momentous event for the ICO. Uh, we will have a limited in-person audience at Clues Hall on Saturday night. Uh, we also have a virtual streaming option for our patrons who aren't yet comfortable. Uh, as we've talked on these programs, so many different changes, uh, of course, in how the orchestra positions itself uh, safely on stage uh, and how uh, we've worked with Clues Hall staff to make sure that the entrance into the hall uh, and the time spent in the concert hall is absolutely as safe as possible. On tonight's program, I am delighted to be joined by our guest artist, uh, who will play the Mozart 24th Piano Concerto, Norman Krieger. Norman, welcome to this broadcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you have an incredible career. And of course, uh, you know anybody can take a look at a bio online in, in, in several moments here. But uh, I want to start off because you have uh, an international performing and recording career. Uh, you've performed with the orchestras in this country and abroad. Uh, and you're also teach. You're also a professor of piano at uh, IU's Jacobs School of Music. Uh, I imagine that when uh, government lockdowns began in March, uh, that your performing career dramatically changed. That might be the understatement of the year. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's been going on in your life for the last ten months? Yeah, it, it it definitely shifted to a new consciousness. Um, I was. Uh, Scheduled actually last spring to record Beethoven's fourth piano concerto with Joanne Folletta and the Buffalo Philharmonic. Um, that, of course, didn't happen. And then I had a whole series of summer concerts um, that uh, were all canceled or, or postponed. Uh, one in particular was a festival in um, uh, the Brevard Music Festival in North Carolina, where I go every summer and uh, the Bergamo Festival in Italy, which, uh, as you know, was hit very, very, very badly by the virus. Um, but then we all be, sort of had to reinvent how we would continue as musicians. So I plunged right in and um, never really used Zoom before um, or Skype, but quickly learned um, that technology um, you know, Zoom, of course, is made for meetings, speaking meetings. And so all of the adjustments in um, uh, volume, dynamics, etc., they would, you know, if somebody was playing for me on the other end, if they were playing too loud, it would adjust it to mezzo forte. If it was too soft, they would make it louder. So we quickly learned to disable um, the audio function in Zoom to get an honest sound. And then I bought a microphone and a um, nice pair of headphones. And so, you know, this is what I've done and music hasn't really stopped. You know, the only thing that's really stopped is of course the in-person contact with colleagues, with students. Um, and of course, playing with orchestra, um, this will be the first time since last January um, that I am going to experience collaboration live, which I'm really excited about. I'm curious to know about the social distancing on stage because, um, of course, playing Mozart is like playing chamber music on a massive scale. You know, you're, you're playing, you know, the equivalent of a piano quintet multiplied by 80 people. And uh, so that should, that's going to be very interesting. And I look forward to that uh, challenge. I've never played a concert, obviously, with a mask before. So that, that will be a first experience for me. Um, I'm looking forward to wearing one of the uh, IS, ICO's masks. I hope 
that I can breathe okay with it. You know, I, I was thinking to myself, well, at least I'm not playing Rachmaninoff or Brahms, where I'd have to huff and puff. With Mozart, there's a lot of singing involved in the phrasing and what have you, but it's a little bit more, uh, well, 18th century, let's put it that way. <laughs> I lo love what you said about, uh, you know, Mozart. And I, I couldn't agree more the idea of, you know, the intimacy of music making, chamber music-esque quality. And, you know, the, the whole idea of socially distanced Music making really seems like a, a an oxymoron. It's antithetical to proper music making. Quartets, wind quintets are always breathing together, watching eyes. And so when we return this summer, you know, I think that sentiment was definitely shared amongst my colleagues. And you know, I've been to several orchestras during the pandemic here. Every orchestra has its own set of procedures, but the idea of six feet separation for string players, one on a stand, winds 12 feet apart, sometimes with plexiglass in between. This is a whole new world for all of us now making music here. And, you know, I do I do wonder um, when things begin to return back to normal, you know, we, we will really even more appreciate, you know, what we have. I know for my own sake, uh, being without concerts, you know, I, I came back to my violin, which had been a little rusty in years. And the idea of just making music for the sake of making music because I couldn't do it publicly was something right. I appreciated very, very much. Uh, Norman, I wanted to ask you, uh, because I've been an admirer uh, of, of your career and, and particularly your, your very broad uh, repertoire. Uh, you mm -hmm. recorded the Brahms Concerto with the London Symphony. You, know, you have all of the major concertos in your repertoire, obviously, but you've done a lot of, of new music as well. You've recorded American piano concertos, probably uh, many of the names unfamiliar to uh, the average listener who only knows you know, maybe Mozart or Beethoven. Can you talk to us a little bit about your musical interests, if you will, about the things that really kind of attract your attention and your, your passion? Well, I've, you know, when I was a student back in the day at Juilliard, I remember that most of my friends, uh, good friends that I, I hung out with and would socialize with were not pianists. They were singers, composers, conductors. Um, because I always felt that the piano was able to imitate in some way, shape, or fashion, or, or create the illusion of imitating other instruments or the human voice. And I was much more drawn to people that were able to play the cello or play the trombone or sing or um, conjure up conceptions as a conductor, you know, where you're, you're basically just using your body language. Um, and so early on, I, I would attend lectures and seminars of Composers. I remember Joel Sachs at, at Juilliard. I, I mean, Vincent Persichetti, David Diamond, um, Leonard Bernstein would come, Aaron Copeland would come. And I would hear these people talk, and they, they were a lot more interesting to listen to than a lot of pianists, um, uh, from at least from my perspective. You know, because I spent, as a pianist, you spend six to eight hours when you're young, you know, a day in a room with your right hand and your left hand, you know, and and your ears. And so there's a lot of attention to detail with the melody and the accompaniment, etc. And, you know, all the great music that we as pianists have in our repertoire, which is just endless. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And so I, I studied the primary meat and potatoes, you know, war horse pieces when I was very young, Liszt Sonata, Tchaikovsky Concerto, um, you know, the major Beethoven sonatas, Bach, suites, etc. But I was always fascinated by the sounds that the piano was capable later on, you know, beyond French music and even Stravinsky um, with uh, George Crumb, Ruggles, Ives, um, Boulez. And of course, now with the young generation, it seems that composers have come back to the muse in a way. There was, a, there was that historic period between uh, right after the Second World War and the 1980s, or at least 1970s, where music sort of went off into a galaxy of uh, major experimentation and ideas and serialism, et cetera, you know, minimalism, um, sound design, I mean, all, all really interesting things. And so I've... I, I, I have always been interested in, in good music, you know. There, I think it was Isaac Stern who said there are two kinds, you know, good and the other kind. 
And so it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter the period when it was written. Um, it's, it's very, I mean, music is such an international language. I've always felt that, um, my, my love for the piano in particular is it has limitless ranges or possibilities. You know, um, and I think a lot of that is due to the fact that when I was young, I heard some of the greatest art musicians. I mean, every night I'd be at Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center or the Metropolitan Museum, and I'd hear, you know, Maria Callas or Pavarotti or von Karajan, Giulini, uh, Horowitz, Oistrakh. And then I go to the Broadway theaters, and I would and I would see plays, you know, um, with great great actors. I mean, I remember seeing Kathy Bates, uh, just knock my socks off. Uh, Al Pacino, uh, Meryl Streep, uh, Shakespeare. So all of these other aspects of art, of of, of you know expression, to me are, are are the reason that I'm a pianist is because I think the pia piano music, ninety eight percent of it is written is based on influences that have nothing to do with the piano. And that's, that's the music that I am drawn to. I'm not really drawn to music that's just written for the instrument. I mean, unless, you know, it can be really creative uh, and have contrast and variety. But to me, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's so much great music. I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of selfish because when I was in my teens, my teacher identified me in terms of my talent, Miss Marcus, it was my Adele Marcus was my teacher, Julia. She said, "Dear," she always called us "dear." She says, "You know, your talent lies in the Viennese classical style." And I, when she said that, um, I thought, "Well, okay, that's nice." But then I said, "Well, wait a minute. What about Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, Liszt, Bartok?" And she says, "Well, you, you can play those composers, dear, but you have you you have to remember that." Pianists are like singers, meaning that singers have their own fach, you know, their own area of, you know, a Wagnerian singer may not sing Mozart as well as they sing Wagner and vice versa. And, and pianists are very much the same kind of animal. There are very few pianists that can play all of the repertoire, you know, at the highest level. And I, and, and I remember she, she pointed, she said, look at Horowitz, for example. She said he can play a mazurka by Chopin or a Scriabin sonata or a Rachmaninoff prelude like no one else. But when it comes to Beethoven or it comes to Brahms, then he has struggles. It's difficult. And it was fascinating to hear that because later on I heard an interview with Horowitz where he said, you know, he said, you know, every musician has a frustration of some kind. Everybody has some frustration. And he said... He said his frustration was that he wanted to be a composer. But very early on, he realized that his compositions were not as, you know, uh, strong as his solo playing. So for me, you know, it, just using that as an example, I mean, I, I made a decision very, when I was very young, that I would play everything as much as possible. So I played new music, music. I mean, David Wiley's Piano Concerto, um, Thomas Svoboda's concerto, um, Judith St. Croix, uh, Lowell Lieberman. These are all people that I knew. That's the other thing is, is you know, having the contact with a living composer to, to be able to say, do you mind if I take a little time here? And then they say, yes, I do. And you go, oh, OK. Whereas, you know, you can't do that with, you know, a lot of those other composers. Um, so I really liked and I still like very much that ability to communicate directly to the composer. And um, because, you know, I, I, I'm a little on one hand, I'm I'm excited about new ideas. But then I'm kind of I realize as I get older that I be, I've become kind of a fuddy duddy, meaning that I really always go back to the score and I always try to figure out, you know, am I getting underneath the music? Am I really able to express you know, what the composer's intent is, you know, and for example, in Mozart, we're all basic, it's basically a transcription today because we're playing on instruments that he didn't have. Um, 
you know, uh, and that goes for everybody because it got strings, you know, and I mean, I don't know about uh, wind instruments, um, but I mean, certainly the, the volume that we're capable of producing today is, is on a whole different stage, you know, uh, and, but again, it goes back to conception of the composer and their creation. Instruments are a means to an end, not an end in themselves. So my goal is to try to emulate what I believe is the stylistic period, the best that I can, even on the modern piano, and the gestures that are no longer in existence, that we still have in Mozart, that we have in the writings of great writers of that period. And those gestures are just as valid and important today, if not even more important than they ever have been for me personally, because they deal with nobility, with grace, tragedy, love, um, comedy, cynicism. <laughs> we, can, we can go through the whole 360 of the human experience. And, you know, anyway, I'm, t I'm talking too much. So very, I agree with the sentiment very much, and especially the, the, the idea of being... Uh, of interacting with a living composer being priceless. We don't have that opportunity. That's something that whenever we commission uh, or join a consortium of orchestras, it's one of the greatest gifts that we have is to be able to, to be part of that creative process, really. So on these programs, we always include a little bit of music. And since we're gearing up for Mozart's birthday uh, on the 27th uh, and celebrating it with our concert on Saturday, uh, we do uh, have a little bit of Mozart. This is the Divertimento in D major. Uh, K136, which we performed our first concert back, uh, which was outdoors at Holiday Park. Um, you recall in the previous program, I mentioned that uh, when we advertised for this concert, we had reserved ticketing. It was a free concert, but uh, just to make sure that people were able to get in uh, and our capacity was filled really within a matter of minutes. People were that eager to experience live music again. So here's a little bit of the outdoor weather at Holiday Park with the Divertimento by Mozart. We'll be right back with Norman Krieger.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're gearing up again for our concert here this Saturday night with Norman Krieger, uh, all Mozart program, Iber, Iber uh, homage uh, on Mozart, which was written or uh, which was commissioned 1956 to celebrate uh, Mozart's uh, uh, anniversary year. We also have the, the great Symphony Number no. 39 in E flat major uh, and the 24th piano concerto uh, in C minor, which is what we're here to discuss uh, with Norman. Uh, Norman, I would love to get your insight. Uh, uh, on the, the Mozart Piano Concerti as a whole, uh, because, you know, we're talking uh, over two dozen concerti that really spanned, you know, the, the earliest years to, you know, some of the last statements in his lifetime. Um, and, you know, I can think of no other of instrument, no other composer who has provided so much um, wealth of, of exquisite music at such a high level. You know, we have two Brahms piano concerto. We have one violin concerto Brahms. So even the, the Mozart violin concerto, the three, four, and five are written within a span of like three and a half months. And you can see the evolution. But he wrote those when he was really a boy still in, Sal in Salzburg. So the piano concerti are just, um, I mean, it's just, I've, I've conducted many of them, not all of them. And every, I don't know which ones I would take uh, to a desert island, honestly. They're all so, uh, so beautifully cracked. I'd just love to get your thoughts. Yeah. You know, uh, study the concerti, perform the concerti. What do these concertos mean to the repertoire and, and to pianists and music lovers? Well, I must confess that this particular concerto that we're doing, number 24 in C minor, um, was a piece that I learned in my teens. Actually, in pre-college, I was at Juilliard in pre-college, and it happened to be the concerto for the competition that year. And um, I didn't know it at all, and I, but I got the music and I learned it. And over the years, uh, when I look back, the perspective that I have now is that Mozart's music, especially the piano concerti, he wrote them for himself to be performed publicly, and which he did. And so these are personal vehicles for him as a composer and as a performer to really express conceptually some of, some of the most open-ended kinds of emotions that I think any composer has ever written. And what I mean by that is if you compare his symphonies or his sonatas, his piano sonatas, or um, string quartets, many of them are, are framed in such an organized way, and not, not to belittle them, but the structure, the architecture, the, the, the actual frame on the picture is very, um, is very much a part of the painting itself in sound. Whereas the piano concerti are almost somewhat frameless. You, you don't, at least when you're in the audience, you don't feel this boundary, you know, that, that encloses them. And, and I think that the character or, or, or the ambiance that this kind of ensemble work um, inspires in me is a freshness and uh, improvisatory almost kind of feeling of dialogue between me with the orchestra. In this case, the winds you know, I mean, it's like a wind concerto in the second movement. You know, it, it's just miraculous what he does uh, with the clarinets and the flutes and the bassoons. Um, so I think that the, the piano concerti, you know, look, M Mozart was a theatrical composer. I mean, he wrote operas like nobody. You know, I mean, they're, they're just so incredibly diverse and interesting and beautiful. And so the piano part of a concerto has this operatic, lyrical, um, nuanced inflection to every single note. You know, and the, the nice thing about the later concerto is you have more markings by Mozart himself about touch and phrasing and dynamics than you do in his earlier concerto. Uh, this concerto, of course, the D minor, the fact that it's a minor key is a big deal because when Mozart writes in a minor key, it's earth shattering. I mean, it's just, he creates this, uh, I wouldn't even say it's Shakespeare. It's almost biblical, you know, this, this, the drama, the temperature in the room changes when Mozart writes in a minor key. I mean, I don't think it's possible to sit in the audience and just be sort of like, ah, oh, you know, maybe in the A major, the B flat, the C major, but C minor and the D minor, 
I think we're all sitting on edge, wondering what's go- what is this message? You know, it's like the horseman has arrived with the letter and the king is reading it and the sweat is starting to come down the brow, you know, and the king's hand is sweating and shaking as well, you know. So the, there's this feeling of, um, uh, how can I say it? It's, it's, it's just very dramatic. Um, and yet at the same time, it's balanced by moments of absolute contrast, which I love. When the C minor to the E flat major, back to the C minor, and then last movement with the variations. You know, every variation is like Goethe used to say, is wearing a different mask. Every, every variation should have a different character, a different personality. Um, and it's interesting in this particular concerto, if you look at the, the autograph, in the last movement, um, when the piece goes from C major back to C minor, the double bar, Mozart painted one of these dramatic faces of the smiling face and the frowning face looking at each other. He actually wrote it in the score, you know, which is, you know, like, what I, I don't know if that comes from the Comedia dell'arte or, um, you know, uh, when you go to the theater, you always see those two faces. And so, I mean, Mozart was clearly conscious of how important it is to reveal um, the humanity in, in his music. You know, there's no composer that comes close to the way he orchestrates, in my opinion. I mean, I, I, I played, I think in my life, I, a lot of concerti, maybe 50 or more different concerti. And the two composers that stand out, or maybe three, how they orchestrate in relation to the keyboard. Um, there's Mozart, Ravel, and maybe Poulenc. They just get it. They figured out that puzzle on how to match piano sounds with the winds, with the strings, with the brass, and it just fits, you know, perfectly. I mean, it's just one dovetails into the next. And, you know, even Beethoven, um, even Brahms or Rachmaninoff or Prokofiev or Bartok, they struggle. You know, the, the, the concerto form itself is really not that easy. Yeah, or the piano concerto form, I, uh, even though there are lots of famous ones, it, it's, it's a very difficult um, thing to, 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 to pull off in terms of the balance between the piano or the keyboard and the orchestra. But Mozart... He understood it, and it was second nature to him. Uh, even on his Walter piano that he had, which was a you know one eighth the sound of the modern Steinway that we have today. Um, but again, I think the uh, the success of the concerti today is the fact that they're they're open ended, and that in general, all of his concerti have this. You know, it, it, it's it's there's not a curtain on it. You know, even the when you think of how the piece begins, the C minor concerto, it's sort of, you know, where, where there's like a fog machine on stage. You know, we're kind of <laughs> there's the dry ice, there's you know creatures floating in the river, and then even at the end, it's kind of the the way it disappears. You know, the, all the actors just leave the stage. There's something uh, eerie about that, and what he reveals. Um, within the three movements, and especially, I think, the last movement is is just astounding. I mean, how one human being, it, it reminds me of Shakespeare, you know, how can one human being reveal so many different parts of, of human nature, you know, from the most pleasant to the most unpleasant, to the most charming, to the most clever and conniving, and, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's what I, I, I get out of these pieces, you know, especially the D minor and the C minor. I mean, the other ones are just much more in the divinity realm, I think, because they're in major keys. And I um, think at the same time he's composing the C minor, he's writing Marriage of Figaro, right. which is one of the greatest, you know, comedies. And, 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 and it has such, uh, such little uh, minor music in it. It's like he was storing up all that minor music 
and he needed to put it somewhere. And this, yes. and the gravity, the intensity, you know, the, the the raw motion of the C minor. Norman, we're really we can't express how delighted we are that you're joining us this Saturday for this performance. Our first live concert back, your first live concert back uh, with you know one of our greatest composers in history. You know, for those of you joining us, wondering how we're doing this, the, the performance is without intermission. Uh, all touchless entry, no programs. There will be digital programs online for your phone. Um, masks, of course. The orchestra will be socially distanced on stage, as we have been doing several times when we perform virtually here. Uh, and everybody will be seated in pods, according to your uh, the group that you uh, you purchased for. So, uh, Clue seats over 2,000 seats, uh, and it was our home many years ago. We are very happy to be back there, and more than you will know, we're happy to be performing for a live audience. So Norman, thank you for your time tonight, your, your insight on music and on Mozart. Uh, I look forward to this weekend very much and uh, wishing all of you who are tuning in a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.